This podcast is brought to you by the Islamic Center and NYU. For more information, visit our website at www.icnyu.org. Assalamualaikum, everyone. It's good to be back. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. As-salatu salam ar-Ashraf al-Musayin al-Bashrah al-Salli al-Salli al-Abni wa ala al-Aqtat al-Musayin al-Qawl al-Qawli. In the name of Allah, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy and prayers and blessings be on His beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So today we're reading Juz number six. SubhanAllah, this month is flying by. So, and it begins off with an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah does not like those who publicly talk about evil except those who are pushing away oppression. Which subhanAllah, two, two pages back, and, and the reason I mentioned this ayah, so ayah number 135 that we read yesterday, and there's a similar verse to it in Surah Ma'idah. So today we're finishing... Um, about four and a half pages from Surah Al-Nisa and the rest of the juz is all in Surah Al-Ma'idah, which is coming up. But there's an ayah in both surahs that reflect each other. And in Surah Al-Nisa, it's, um, it's ayah 135, and it says, O you who believe, be upright with justice, witnesses for Allah. Even if it's against yourself, your parents, or those who are, or your family members, if it's someone that is rich or poor, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has more right to them and do not follow your own desires, don't let your desires lead you away from justice. And if you turn if you turn away, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more aware of what you are doing. And in Surah Al-Ma'idah, it's a similar surah, but it actually, uh, sorry, excuse me, a similar ayah, but it actually switches. And this is ayah number eight in Surah Al-Ma'idah, where it says, O oh, you who believe, be upright for Allah witnesses for justice and it's actually in some way the fact that it's using in both surahs the same wording but switching being upright for Allah and witnesses for justice and in this ayah it's saying upright for justice witnesses for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sorry excuse me surah nisa it switches them that it's it's telling you that they're one in the same being upright for justice is standing up for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and and subhanallah our religion is always between justice and mercy Justice is everyone getting their rights, and then mercy and compassion, rahma, is a higher level where hopefully you're feeding a cycle of good, subhanAllah. And I just thought it was really beautiful that these two surahs are mentioned, these ayat, and yet this chapter that, we're, sorry, this just number six that we're beginning, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, do not publicly talk about things that are bad so that you're not bringing up like negativity in the community. And it makes a very clear exception. It says, except for those who are oppressed. Because if you are oppressed, it becomes your right upon everyone else in the group to make sure that your rights are restored to you. Subhanallah. I just thought it was really, really fascinating. Subhanallah. The, the series of ayat continue. And again, we're talking about the role of prophethood in Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks, like mentions a series of ayat, a series of prophets in ayah number... 163, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu we've revealed to you as we have revealed to Nuh and the Prophets after him and Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail and Ishaq and Yaqub and the 12 tribes of Israel and Isa and Ayyub and Yunus and Harun and Sulaiman and it mentions a series of Prophets and it says there are Prophets that we have mentioned to you and Prophets that we have not mentioned to you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salam and again it's saying that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam is the culmination of prophethood since the beginning of time. And part of the reason that we follow the different prophets and saying we don't make distinctions between the prophets, we value all of the prophets, subhanAllah. So it's part of the benefit of following in the footsteps of all of these prophets is it's showing us our capacity as human beings. Can a human being overcome extreme amounts of oppression? Yes, because Musa alayhi salam did. Can, can women overcome um misogyny that is laced with religious language yes because Sayyidina Maryam alayhi salam did can someone who is kicked out of their home still reach spiritual felicity yes because Ibrahim alayhi salam did and you have these stories of all of these different prophets and we learn from all of them and we don't we don't divide between them because they're all ultimately from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're part of the continuation of humanity that is worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then in the middle is saying, it, it continues to give you these different rules about inheritance, about how to handle our money, how to do different things. And it's, 
subhanallah so it's saying all of these different things and it's at the same time it's giving you these rulings that is are ultimately what's better for you subhanallah we did a class at union theological seminary uh, a few of us and we were talking about islamic liberation theology and a lot of it is actually founded in money about what does it mean that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala razaq how do you not keep you using usury and we riba and what's interesting is in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually uses the word that they use. They call it interest. They're like, I'm not, I'm not using people. I'm just, I'm, I'm getting interest. My money is working for me. But what it does is that it's making, making the separation between the, what making the wealth gap bigger. And then zakah is by design supposed to have money flow from, from the wealthiest, from the top to the bottom. So that again, that wealth gap doesn't keep getting bigger. And it keeps equalizing people in society, subhanAllah. So all of these rulings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put forth for us, they are by design to bring more balance into our society by way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanding it. It becomes an issue of morality to make sure that there isn't a huge wealth gap where people, some people are, are extremely rich and others don't have enough to eat, subhanAllah. It also mentions the issues of the people of the book. And I just thought it was interesting how... It's talking about how they, they killed the prophets before. And they accused Sayyidina Maryam alayhi salam without any right. And it's mentioning those, and, and they used usury, and it's mentioning these sins as part of the reason that they lost the sakina, the aura of prophethood that was sent to them. May Allah protect us of ever getting to that place. And as long as we are standing upright for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we... Inshallah, we will continue to have that or and we will continue to be a force of good. SubhanAllah. Surah Al-Ma'idah begins and it says, O oh, you who believe, fulfill your bonds. Fulfill the, the, the bonds that you were entrusted with. Both, And it keeps it open-ended where it's with other people or with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again goes into very specific fiqh, fiqh-related things where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, don't eat pork. Don't eat the animal that, that died on its own. Don't eat the animal that fell off the mountain. And they're very, very specific rulings. And in the midst of that series of ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, today is the day I've completed for you your religion. I've perfected for you your religion. I have completed my favor upon you. And I am content with Islam as your religion. Can you imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us, I am content with this system for you to bring about justice for humanity? SubhanAllah, in the midst of a discussion on food. And we realize just how much like environmental justice is intertwined with food justice, is intertwined with racial justice, is intertwined with so many different systems in our society. So it's, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about all of these things together as one in the same. There's a misconception that the, this is actually the last ayat that were revealed. They weren't actually the ayah, I believe, at the end of... Um, it's towards the end of Surah Al-Baqarah is actually the one that was the last to be revealed. This was towards the end, but it wasn't the actual last ayah to be revealed. But it was revealed towards the end of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu after the final hajj. It was his last huge public address after he came back from hajj is when he started to feel, feel ill, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and, and entered the illness of that ultimately resulted in his, his death, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it was his last public address. And there was actually a man that... Um, one of the, it was a Jewish man from the people of the book that when he heard this ayah, he went, he went to one of the companions. He said, if we had a verse like this, it would become a day of celebration for us. And Sayyidina Umar al responded to him. He said, in fact, it is, it is actually the day of Arafah. So every year as we're celebrating, inshallah, in two months, two and a half months, as we celebrate the day of Arafah, we're actually celebrating the culmination of Islam in our tradition and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala celebrating this ayah for us. There's a really important point where it's saying they ask you what has been made halal for them and it responds and it says, tell them what's been made halal for them is everything that is good, wholesome and righteous. Everything that is tayyib, everything that is good for you is halal and everything that's bad for you is haram. And again, we talked about this when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us something it's haram, he's protecting us from harm. When he tells us something that is halal, it means that it could, there can be benefit for it and for us in it. And when he commands us to do something, it is for our own good. It is out of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this isn't 
doesn't mean that if we if we make a mistake, then that's the end of it. When you make a mistake, you do tawbah. You reflect on the perfection of Allah, your own imperfection. You do tawbah and you just try again next time. And you try better next time. And as long as we are consistently trying to do our best, then this is all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks of us. And it's also not if you make a mistake, it's when you make a mistake. Because as human beings, we all make mistakes. Also in the series of ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us how to purify ourselves before prayer. There's the ayat about wudu. Subhanallah, it, it, it brings us, it, it's just the purification. And I want to stop on ayah number 12, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have taken an, we took an oath from Bani Israel. And again, we're talking about people that received a prophet before us. And hopefully, like, we'll, we'll, we'll protect ourselves from the mistakes, but also try to do our best with our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, وَقَالَ اللَّهُ إِنِّي مَعَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them, I am with you. If you establish the prayer and you give zakah and you believe in my Prophet and you honor him and you give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a, a, a good loan and it's part of the investment that we're making in our lives is investing our time towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and investing our money towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's really, really simple. Establish the prayer, give your zakah, honor the Prophet ﷺ, put in time towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds and says, I will forgive your sins and I will enter you into, into the gardens from which rivers will flow beneath them. We keep making Islam difficult and complicated and it's not. It is simple by design. And if we all collectively sign on to goodness and righteousness and doing our best, we change society. We change everything around us. If we were a society of people of everyone trying to do their best and lifting each other up, we will all be uplifted. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only tasks us with our own part and just do your part. SubhanAllah. May Allah accept from all of us. May Allah bring us all closer to him in, in this month. And may Allah accept all of our good deeds. All right. Greetings, peace and blessings be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi We'll go ahead and get started. We start in the name of God, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. We ask him to send his peace and his blessings upon his messenger, upon our messenger and master Muhammad. So this is uh, Juz 7 or section 7. And uh, there are a lot of things in here I want to talk about. Probably we'll get through most, if not all of them. So we're going to be finishing the chapter entitled Al-Ma'ida, the chapter entitled The Table Spread, and start Surah Al-An'am, the chapter that is the cattle. So the remainder of Al-Ma'ida, we talked about how this chapter speaks uh, plenty about the similarities between the people of the book, uh, the Jews and the Christians, their beliefs and what the Muslims believe in, but also focuses on the ways in which the previous scriptures have been corrupted or tainted and how the Quran as a perfect scripture has been revealed to fix those, those errors. Um, and then there's also discussion towards the end of this chapter of the Muslims to avoid certain things, intoxicants, gambling, uh, as well as hunting in the sacred precincts. Um, so just to talk about the table spread, right? The story after which this chapter is named, uh, in both in the Christian Muslim traditions, it's recognized that there were 12 uh, close followers or apostles of Jesus, uh, Isa alayhi salam, peace be upon him. Uh, and at the end of this chapter, you'll see that the uh, disciples request, right, from Jesus uh, that he bring down a request from God, uh, a table filled with food. Now, already, as made clear in this chapter, uh, Jesus is the source of many miracles, brings the dead back to life, heals the leper and the blind, uh, brings the clay shape of a bird uh, into life. Um, and so when they make this request, then Jesus responds, peace be upon him, alayhi salam, and he says, Essentially, right, do you doubt all the signs have been given? I'm truly a messenger. And they say, as is written in this chapter, we wish to eat from it so that our hearts may be at peace. And so we know you spoke the truth and we can be among the witnesses. And Imam al-Razi, one of the scholars of Islam, he says that this request of the apostles is similar to the request that Ibrahim, السلام, uh, Abraham makes to God when he says earlier in the Quran, he says, Abraham asks God, how do you bring the dead back to life? And Allah asks the prophet Abraham, do you, do you not believe? And he says, but 
uh, my heart would like to be reassured, right? Where my heart would like to be given that reassurance of faith. And so in this case, the disciples are then granted their requests. Ibn Kathir writes that they uh, followed a 30 day fast after this request. And then Jesus requested the table of food and that was given down. And they of course, you know, uh, um, you know then followed and accepted and reaffirmed their commitment to, to Jesus and to the oneness of God. The thing I wanna derive from here is that in both instances, the disciples and also a prophet like Abraham, right? Ibrahim Salam, they sincerely sought out the truth, right? And in doing so, they uh, uh, had questions, they made requests uh, and those types of steps and, and um, you know, those types of steps to understand things better um, are totally valid. As long as there is the underlying um, respect and understanding that the truth is something that, um, you know, is, is uh, what's meant to be respected and followed, right? The moment we start to believe that the truth or what we believe is our faith um, is something that we can see ourselves above, right? That we can be arrogant about it or that we are above certain aspects of it, then it disrupts any sort of sincere pursuit of the truth or deeper acknowledgement, understanding of the truth. And so, you know, I think about the hadith with the prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, he says in a hadith Qudsi, right, where God speaks in the first person, Allah says, for the servant who draws close to me by a hand, I draw close to them by an arm. And for the servant who draws close to me by an arm, I draw close to them by a fathom, imagine six feet. And for the servant who comes to me walking, I come to them running. I think it's clear that uh, it's not that every single part of this faith will immediately make sense to each and every one of us, right? There are things to understand, think through parts of our knowledge that may not be complete, some issues that are complex, but as long as the pursuit of the truth and the pursuit of the divine is sincere, then as we see from the disciples and the prophet Abraham, those requests can indeed be fulfilled and that can surely cause that reassurance and that, that sort of peace that our hearts are yearning for. The other thing in Ma'idah I want to focus on this chapter uh, is the presence of good and bad. Allah says in this chapter, say, O Prophet, uh, bad cannot be likened to good, though you may be dazzled or impressed by how abundant the bad is. Be mindful of God, people of understanding, so that you may prosper. So here Allah draws a distinction between bad and good, that they are clearly two separate things and that you O prophet, and also humankind should not be dazzled or oppressed or in awe by the bad, no matter how abundant it is. We think about oftentimes quality versus quantity, right? In this life, most things are measured by quantity. You're not considering the condition of a person's soul uh, uh, or their ethics when you hire them for a job. It's more so the tangible experiences, the achievements that they've accomplished. And when you think about just the accumulation of wealth or material, for example, the quantity could make us in awe or inspired or attracted just by the sheer uh, amassing of wealth. But if the means of amassing that wealth means utilizing uh, child labor or prison labor, right? Or uh, stripping away uh, any sort of livable income from employees or charging immense amounts of interest. And in this case, uh, any interest whatsoever and ripping off people of their loans, then what value does that quantity have? if there is no quality or substance to it. So here Allah says that the bad is not like the good, which is a simple statement, but don't be dazzled or impressed by the bad just because of its abundance or its quantity. The last thing of al that which I thought was just beautiful, refers to the expiation or the kafara when someone breaks an oath. So there's a verse here where Allah says that the atonement for breaking an oath, and in this case, it refers to someone who made a binding promise uh, to do or not do something in the future, uh, but then they broke that promise, right? So of course you have to rectify that, but the atonement for having erred in that way is to feed 10 poor people with food equivalent to what you would normally give your own families or to clothe them or to set free a slave. If a person cannot find the means, he should fast three days. Uh, it's beautiful to see that even when it comes to uh, human to human agreements and interactions, when a person errs, right, they need to rectify the situation with that individual, with that party, in this case, in breaking an oath, but also there needs to be a social good done. There needs to be uh, uh, separately a constant uh, uh, acknowledgement and, and recognition 
of who within society still needs support. And I think the fact that someone breaking an oath results in them having to, for example, free a slave, there is a connection there, right? In which our hearts are constantly being drawn towards the most vulnerable in society. So much so that even if we uh, err in regards to interaction with someone, the benefit should still fall on the most vulnerable. They should still somehow reap the benefit uh, of our own wrongdoing, right? And that way the, the goodness it spreads. Surah Al-An'am, this is the next chapter. This is a Makkan Surah revealed in the earlier years of the Prophet's mission of being a Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what you'll immediately notice in this chapter is there's not so much an emphasis on uh, specific ethics or rules regarding what can be consumed or what can be done, but rather is a greater focus on this idea that previous prophets have been sent down, right? And there have been previous nations that were sent down these messages uh, that are very arrogantly disbelieved. Uh, and then you also have uh, discussions around the signs of God, the presence of God, right? That there is one God that is all powerful and all magnif magnificent. And you'll see in this chapter, plenty of reminders of God's bounty specifically in nature from the rain and vegetation to the animals and the plants. Um, one of the things I wanna focus on here um, is the sort of ways in which the Quran served as a type of therapy for the Prophet Wasallam. So in the early years when the Prophet and his community were in Mecca, they were in the minority and they were never prescribed to fight against their aggressors in defense because of how small of a number they were, at how um, chaotic that may have, uh, uh, it would have resulted if a battle broke out when they were that small in number. And so Allah constantly provides words of solace to the Prophet as he's enduring this pain, seeing his community of believers being persecuted, oppressed, at some points being even killed uh, by the Meccans at that time. Uh, and Allah says, Right, that we know well that what they say grieves you, Prophet. It is not you they disbelieve, the evildoers they reject God's revelation. And he says later or earlier that the life of this world is nothing but a game and a distraction. The home and the hereafter is best for those who are aware of God. And I think it's beautiful as we read the Quran to also understand that this was not just a book that appeared right in full text and form. It was relayed verse by verse through uh, the most beloved, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him. And that some of these verses uh, were very much designed to reassure and grant solace to the prophet when he himself was struggling internally. And God so beautifully says, it's not you they disbelieve. You're not the issue here as a person. It's that this message you bring, this revelation, it causes so much disruption culturally, societally, that these other people are too arrogant to even give it a sincere chance to understand the value of the truth. And this is, you know, for us to also understand the intimacy with which God knows the anxieties, the doubts, the struggles within our own hearts, right? To the extent that there should be that constant reassurance that the one who says he is qareeb, the most near to us, is the one who knows each of our struggles most intimately, more than anyone or anything in this world. Um, another thing I want to talk about is two more verses. One, speaking about the company that you keep. So there's a verse in Al-Am An -Am, where Allah says, and this is directed to the Prophet, do not drive away those who call upon their Lord morning and evening, seeking nothing but his face. If you drove the believers away, you would become one of the evildoers. And this is in reference to the fact that the early community of believers were the most downtrodden. They were the freed slaves, uh, uh, the, the most marginalized, the one without any sort of tribe or clan affiliation, uh, plenty of women. And Allah is saying, because some of the tribal leaders who had the status and the clout within that society wanted the prophet to bring them in, but bring them in by pushing away those who were the most poor. Right, because they didn't want to be associated with the poor as part of this community of believers. And it goes to show, right, that there weren't sincere intentions on behalf of these clan leaders, right, who simply just wanted to preserve their clout and not have to deal with a religion that strips them away of certain privileges that the society granted at that time. And God says to the prophet, keep the company of those who are with you, the poor and the downtrodden, don't drive them away. And this is just a point I want to mention uh, is that we also have to think when it comes to the company we keep, how diverse are those circles amongst us? And I think specifically for myself, you know, coming through and having the blessing of pursuing, for example, a bachelor's education, 
how much of the people I now socialize with have bachelor's degrees? If I or someone else, you pursue a master's, how many of those people now just have a master's? That you know have this greater distance from folks who don't have that kind of education or socioeconomic standing, let alone the people who come from different ethnic or racial backgrounds or just from different walks of life altogether, be they different creeds or belief systems. Here, God is emphasizing to the prophet to keep the company of the most poor at the expense of foregoing the insincere intentions of the, the Qurayshi leaders or the clan leaders who wanted Islam, but also wanted to fit their own agenda. And I think it's also good for us to think, how much are we ensuring that our hearts are grounded in communities and in the types of groups of people that are getting overlooked within our society, within our own community? Uh, because very subtly, when we climb up the educational ladder, the social ladder, the corporate ladder, you start to see your circles getting insulated, right? And you become more distanced from those who are the most vulnerable. So you have to continue that practice of ensuring our circles remain diversified. The last point I want to mention talks about uh, God's knowledge and his mercy. And this is referring to verse 59, where Allah says, uh, He says, and with him are the keys of the unseen. None knows them except him. And he knows what is on the land and in the sea. Not a leaf falls, but that he knows it. And no grain is there within the darkness of the earth, but that it is written in a clear record. What's powerful about this is Allah uses the parable of how we experience nature and creation to demonstrate the depth of his knowledge. I remember once, you know, we were going on a hike with Sheikh Dawood, Imam Dawood Yasin, uh, you know, out in the forest somewhere, and obviously plenty of trees, whole lot of leaves, right, just all over the ground. And he reminded us of this verse where God says that not a leaf, a single leaf within this world falls except that he has knowledge of it. And it gives you a deeper ability to appreciate the vastness of the knowledge uh, of your Lord, of the one who is the most merciful. And specifically in this chapter, Allah Azza wa continues to draw from the experiences we see in nature to exemplify the extent of his power, his generosity, and his mercy. Uh, and the point I want to end on is uh, we should never underestimate the presence that uh, being in nature and around that which is part of the natural environment, the impact it can have on our souls. You know, one of my teachers, he said to me, the reason that our hearts feel so at peace when we're out on a hike somewhere deep in the mountains or the woods or somewhere where there's uh, just nature around us is because everything that is created and in creation around you at that point is fully submitting in alignment with what is God's decree. The trees perform their roles in alignment with how God decreed them uh, to perform their deeds or perform their actions. The way the plants grow, the way the water and the dirt interact and mix and then cause life to grow out of the ground. Um, and so it's beautiful in this chapter, you'll see how much nature plays a role in our understanding of God. And we have to use that also as a tool uh, to deepen that relationship with our creator. In the name of Allah, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy and prayers and blessings be on his beloved Prophet Muhammad. So today we're starting um, the eighth juz, which means that we have already finished, subhanAllah, an entire week of Ramadan. May Allah accept it from us. But Surah Al-An'am is... Is really is actually one of my favorite surahs in the Quran, and I say that about so many surahs that a lot of people tell me I don't understand what the word favorite means. But <laughs> Surah Al An'am is the surah that we're we're going to finish the second half of it, and then we're going to begin Surah Al Araf today, inshallah. Surah Al An'am, what it it when it was revealed, it was revealed, and there were I believe it was ten thousand angels that came down with it as a celebration, and even though it's one of the longer surahs, it came all down all at once. And it was such a celebration because it was, it fixes a lot of the aqidah and the theological issues that people had before, whether it was the theological issues of the people of Mecca, the pagans or the idol worshippers at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi the pre-Islamic idol worshippers or the people of the book or any of, any of the theological issues that people seem to have. And there's a couple of series of verses in here. One of my favorite is actually an, um, a series. We, we recited it yesterday, but I think it's really important to bring up when Ibrahim alayhi salam, Prophet Abraham is doing da'wah with his people. 
and he's trying to make a point to them. And at this point, he's a young man. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the ayah says that we, we showed Ibrahim alayhi salam the deeper meanings of the, the material world. And a lot of the times we say the material world is horrible. It's not horrible. It is designed to remind us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's designed to show us the meaning behind every single material thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he goes to his people and the ayah is so specific as saying when it was pitch black, when the night was completely taken over and in the winter you can actually see Jupiter. The ayah says, Ra'a he saw a planet. He told his people, this is my Lord, this is what we should worship. And of course, this you couldn't the next day you couldn't see the planet anymore because the sun had come up. And when he says this, he goes to his people and he says, I cannot worship something that's not constant. And then the next day it says, when he saw the, the moon in all of its beauty and glory, he said, This is my Lord. And then of course the sun the sun rose and you couldn't see the moon anymore. And he said, If my God, if my Lord doesn't guide me. I will not be guided. And then the third day, when the sun came up and he saw the beauty and the majesty of the sun, he said, this is my Lord. And of course, the sun sets. And when the sun sets, he says, I believe I worship the one that is that created and is beyond the sun, the moon and the planets and everything in the sky. I'm worshiping what is beyond all of those things. And he's telling us that our most foundational beliefs about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that Allah is constant, that Allah is greater than us, that he needs to guide us for us. He needs to tell us about himself because he's beyond our capability. And he is the one that is in charge of the entire material world. And the reason this is important is because the, the, we start actually this chapter, Ayah 111, it says that if, we, if, if, they, if the disbelievers that are, that are pushing away the Prophet Wasallam. If they witnessed the angels, if the dead spoke to them, they would still say it's magic. And part of the reason we take the beauty of creation for granted is because it's because there's so much of it that we're like, oh, it's just normal. But it's so stunningly beautiful. There's such complexity to it. There's such beauty to it. They say that one of the evidence of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the, the fact that we can recognize beauty. How could, how could you see or recognize beauty if it wasn't for the, the artistry and the beauty that Allah created in the first place? And there are a lot of aqidah discussions that people have. It's um, Ilm al-Kalam is one of the Islamic sciences. And essentially, it was taking people through the journey of if you believe in cause and effect, then Allah is the original cause. And they go into like deep discussions about you can't have cyclical series, you can't like there's it's a deeper discussion. But foundationally, it's saying if you believe in cause and effect, then there had to have been an original cause. And based on the effect that we see in the universe, we're attributing the ability to create, the power to create, the just subhanAllah, the majesty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in the world. Allah's ability to communicate with us. We're, we're attributing all of these things to Allah, and this is an entire science in the Islamic studies. There's, subhanAllah, the, the surah is really, really beautiful, and it, and it debunks a lot of the, the, the claims that the people of the time of the Prophet, the, the, the pagan Arabs had come up with. And they had a lot of weird traditions. It also essentially, in Ayah 151, when you recite it, it's essentially... The commandments are the ten com similar to the Ten Commandments in the Jewish and Christian traditions. Because again, the Prophet ﷺ is continuing the tradition of all of the prophets that came before him. And there's a lot of discussion about Sayyidina Ibrahim ﷺ in the surah. And I just, these are some of my favorite ayats in the Quran where you hear Ibrahim ﷺ making the dua, and it's ayah 162, and it says, Say that my prayer my worship, my life, and my death all belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the worlds. There is no partner with him. This is what I've been commanded, and I am the first of the Muslims. And it just, a lot of the times we compartmentalize and we're like, oh, we pray towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we do what we want otherwise. Our intentionality can make our entire lives for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of our acts of worship. He says, salati, my prayer, all of my worship, my life, and my death are all for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And may Allah allow us to follow in the footsteps of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. SubhanAllah. Um, the next, then we start Surah Al-Araf. And Surah Al-Araf is very interesting. So the Araf are these heights. They translate it to the heights or like mountains or like it's, it's an, an elevated area on the Day of Judgment. And the reason it's called Surah Al-Araf is that there's people that are, that are stuck on the Araf. You can see the people that are getting sorted, the people that are end up going to Jannah and the people that are sent to the fire, may Allah protect us from it. And there's people that just kind of got stuck. They didn't really commit to one or the other. And even in the ayat, you can hear how the people of Jannah and the people of the fire are communicating with each other. And they're saying, did, did you find what God had promised you to be true? And they say, yes. And they communicate with each other. And the Araf comment, and no one responds to them. And the surah is very interesting. It starts off and it's saying how many people were sent punishment while they were asleep. This apathetic public is kind of the goal. The goal of this surah is to remove us from being ap the apathetic public that just didn't do anything. Right now, we're in a moment in our country where there's the, the, the jury is out for deliberation on the man that murdered George Floyd. And the thing is, we've been here before. There was Rodney King, there was Tamir Rice, there was, there was so many people. There was Michael Brown, there were so many people. And there's a moment right now that we really need to be able to stand up and, and hopefully as a country not have the same injustice repeat again. And the surah is designed to, make, to pull us out of this heedlessness of saying it's not my problem. It begins with the story of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam and how the, the shaytan actually brought him out of Jannah. And it was this jealousy and arrogance that, that, that motivated him. And you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Adam alayhi salam, like, go worship at the mosques. Dress nicely when you go to worship on all of the places of worship on earth. But then you see how Satan is trying to pull him down. And subhanAllah, Dr. Um, I'm blanking out on his name. Dr. Bilal Ware actually talks about how Adam alayhi salam was, he wasn't just black. The name Adam means very dark skin. Anti-blackness is inherently satanic. Because this was Satan decided that he hated Adam alayhi salam before Adam alayhi salam had, had, a, had a soul inside of him to even be able to, commute, to do anything. He hated him from his outer form before he saw anything else. And he's saying the anti-blackness is inherently satanic. And then what it can, the surah continues and it talks about a series of prophets. And each time it talks about the prophet and it talks about the mala, the elites, the elites of the society that fought the prophet. It wasn't that the average person necessarily minded the idea of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there were elites that decided that if this prophet succeeded, that they were going to take away from their power. And it's recognizing that power is not just political power. Someone speaking the truth is powerful because it motivates people and forces them to see the better versions of themselves. And it goes through one prophet after another until it gets to the story of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, and Pharaoh. And it talks about that story in so much more detail. And the one thing I want to point out about that, so the story of Musa alayhi salam in this, in this chapter, is this is the only chapter in the Qur'an. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam was the most often mentioned person in the Qur'an period. In this chapter, this is the point where it actually talks about the plagues of Egypt. They had so many signs from Sayyidina, that Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam brought to them to prove that he was a prophet from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they kept disbelieving one after the other. And mind you, Pharaoh is telling everyone, I am a god. Well, you don't look very godly when your fields are covered in locusts, when your monuments are covered in frogs, when your waters turn to blood. And it was designed that way so that the average person could not miss it. Part of what coronavirus did to us is it affected every single person around the world 
And it exposed all of the inequities that we have in our society. When it first started off, they're like, oh, this is the great equalizer. Whether you're rich or poor, you can get sick the same way. But if you're rich, you have more space to quarantine. And if you're poor, you're called an essential worker. And you have to fight for hazard pay. You have to fight to get paid for the fact that you are risking your life. Whereas the people that are not risking their lives are sitting comfortably and didn't feel the effects of it at all. This disease disproportionately killed people of color. When, when New York was hit, the Bronx was hit harder than anyone else because there's a highway that goes through the middle of the Bronx that gave so many more people their asthma. It was so much more deadly for them. It is not, it's everything we've been through in the last year, year and a half has been hard. It really has been difficult. And we've lost a lot of people. It's been tragic. But the greater tragedy is for us to go through everything we went through in the last year and a half and to still not have learned the lessons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made so clear to us. May Allah protect us from ever being people that just, that just don't care. May Allah wake up everyone that is sleeping, that is saying it's someone else's problem. If when they were separating children at the border, they couldn't find someone to hire to separate the children, they couldn't have been able to do it. The general public that people belittle are actually very, very powerful. And us speaking the truth is very, very powerful. May Allah allow us to be on the side of the people that always speak the truth. May Allah allow us to join the prophets in Jannah. May Allah allow us to be with, with the prophets and the truth tellers and with with everyone that we love and with the Prophet وسلم, on the day of judgment in Jannah. Ameen. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala wa sahbihi wa sallam and prayers and blessings be on his beloved Prophet and his family and his companions. We start in the name of God, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. Uh, we ask that he send his choices, peace and blessings upon his master and his messenger, uh, Muhammad. Um, so today we're going into Juz 9, section 9 of the Quran. Um, and before we do that, I thought it'd be important just to uh, take a moment to reflect on really what uh, happened today um, and, and actually a few things that have happened today. Um, I think the main thing that a lot of us have seen, whether on the news or on our feeds, is that uh, a man by the name of Derek Chauvin, who murdered George Floyd, as we saw last year, um, was officially convicted by a jury on three counts. And this is something where uh, as much as uh, the egregiousness of the act uh, was evident and the uh, maliciousness, the, the, the lack of humanity, the lack of regard for human life was apparent, uh, it took almost an entire year. Uh, it took a national uprising of millions of people. Uh, it took uh, the injuring and in some cases the death of dozens of protesters, uh, mainly black folk, uh, in order for this verdict to actually occur and for the semblance of justice to actually be served. Um, what you're seeing in a lot of organizing spaces, especially as people are saying that this is uh, accountability, but this is not justice. Um, and I think that's important for us to keep in mind is that the accountability is that someone has been uh, at least taken to account for what they did, but true justice would have been George Floyd uh, being back home with his family, with his daughter, Gianna, uh, with his fiance, with his partner, Courtney. Um, and the reason why it's, it's important for us to, to just take a second to, to think about this verdict is because um, even though we see this one instance of someone getting convicted, an officer getting convicted, uh, the past 10 days have shown time and time again uh, that the system is not built for people uh, wearing law enforcement uniforms to actually be held accountable uh, when they commit acts uh, that are pure evil. Uh, the fact that 10 miles away last week, you had uh, Dante Wright, who was shot and killed by a police officer, 10 miles away from where Derek Chauvin killed George Floyd, uh, is indicative of how badly corrupted this entire system is. Uh, and it also speaks to uh, the fact that uh, how we conceptualize addressing ills within our society um, is, is extremely uh, corrupt in that sense as well. Uh, we still only know how to respond 
to any kind of crisis with force. You know, some people would argue, hey, at least the police as sexist, ableist, racist as it is, uh, it still protects us from crime and violence. Uh, the reality is that uh, using law enforcement to address the issues that result in crime are not gonna reduce the crime. The issues of economic instability and lack of investment and resources, all things that the police were never trained to address, uh, those issues will continue to persist. What's important for us, especially for those here who are Muslim who are tuning in, is that as Dr. Amina spoke about yesterday, uh, one of the greatest uh, uh, diseases of the heart that we have to be cognizant of, of entering into our own souls, is the disease of apathy. If you are able to continue your day today, not thinking much uh, about what this conviction means, uh, specifically and primarily for Black folks across this country, uh, that is a privilege that uh, exists for you. And it's not to say it's a bad thing, but it's recognizing that certain issues aren't bearing on your heart in the same way. What could can quickly result, though, is that turns into apathy, that those issues are no longer pertinent to us, right? We spoke about a few days ago, the degree to which the Prophet ﷺ, peace be upon him, was intimately aware of even the most impoverished and the downtrodden with his society. There was never the excuse of, because I'm of a certain status or class or background, that the issues pertaining to other folks within my society are no longer relevant to me. I think one key example of that was a woman by the name of Umm Mahjan, radiallahu anha. She was the woman who, uh, during the time of Medina, was too poor to be able to actually offer or give anything of benefit or material back to the Muslim community. But she wanted to volunteer in some capacity, so she started cleaning the masjid. She started cleaning the place of prayer, the place of congregation that Muslims would go to to worship God. And as we think about, for a lot of our masajid and mosques and Islamic centers today, uh, how often are we overlooking uh, the very people who clean and scrub the floors and the toilets and the prayer rugs for us to be able to worship, right? And so the instance comes where Prophet Sallallahu knowing her and having built a relationship with her where he would speak to her, check in on her, ask her how she's doing. One day he comes to the masjid and realizes that she's missing. And he asks some of the companions nearby, where is Umm Mahjan? And they said to her that she had passed away. And he then asks, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why was I never made aware of this? And the companions basically said, as is reported in the narration, that uh, we believe that, uh, you know, since you were sleeping and this was someone who died, who held this sort of position, basically her death didn't really mean much in the way that we didn't feel it was necessary to trouble you by waking you up because she passed away in the middle of the night. So we took care of the burial, the janazah, and we buried her. And the Prophet ﷺ was reported to have been visibly angry hearing this. And he asks them, he says, take me to where she's buried. And they take him there. And this is one of the few instances where he actually prays upon the grave of a deceased, showing the degree to which he was connected to even someone as marginal, someone as easily to be overlooked as Umm Mahjan, the one who cleaned the Masjid radiallahu anha. So again, for us, as momentous as a day as this is, and especially for people who have been very severely impacted by the system, for those of us who are not connected to these issues, the question is how deep is that apathy? And if it is there, in what ways have I sought to uh, 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 rectify the apathy by either engaging with or being around or learning from or reading the books of people who have been through these issues and know these issues intimately. Uh, there is a, a book that I would recommend for people to read that um, really speaks about this case of abolition. It's by the woman by the name of Mariam Kaaba. Uh, we don't stop uh, until they free us. I'm forgetting the, the title, but it just came out this year. Mariam Kaaba is her name. Uh, and, and she's a fellow abolitionist organizer, a fellow Muslim, uh, some of the folks like her from whom we're supposed to learn from. Uh, and so I mentioned that uh, just for us to keep that in mind. Also, as we go into this juz, this is section nine uh, of the Quran. So we are finishing Surah Al-A'raf uh, that Dr. Amina had started yesterday. And now uh, we'll be going into what is Surah Al-Anfal, the chapter entitled The War Spoils. Um, and so... 
the main thing or that the, the main theme I would want to derive from the end of At-Rath is that there are prophets after prophets being mentioned, right? This is a Makkan surah. So this is earlier in the period of prophethood. There's not so much focus on the Islamic law, but more so trying to present the case to the Quraysh who are arrogantly disregarding this message about Islam, about the oneness of God, knowing that their clout and their status is at stake. And so the, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal through the Quran reminds them of previous nations who through their arrogance and disregard for opening their hearts to the truth and quite honestly from preventing their hearts from being willing to transform and change, uh, they ended up bringing about their own ill fate and their own demise. And so you see Shu'ayb alayhi salam, peace be upon him. Uh, you see um, uh, the prophet Musa, Moses, peace be upon him. And then of course, even in the life of the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, right? Thank you, we do this till we feel us. Uh, uh, so each of those prophets, right? Time and time again, the reality is that they brought a message that was meant to transform society, right? redistribute uh, the wealth, the power, um, you know, the sort of control that existed, where there aren't these hefty people in control uh, being able to exploit or take advantage of the downtrodden and then wield all the status for themselves, right? But the interesting thing is that each of these prophets, when they came to their leaders or their kings, right, Moses to Pharaoh, Shu'aib to his people who are described as the strongest of people, None of these prophets ever said, I am demanding your authority, right? Or I'm demanding to, you know, your, your power to be usurped. They simply said that this is uh, the message of the oneness of God. We are to humble ourselves beyond, uh, uh, under a greater power to which we have an obligation to serve, right? That there is that um, uh, relationship that we're supposed to cultivate that goes beyond the feeding of simply the nafs and the ego. And in each of these instances, the leaders, the kings, they felt that their power was threatened, right? And so what does Allah Azza wa do? He administers his justice. Sometimes when we read the Quran, we're reading and we see the way God describes how entire towns, right? Or entire peoples were destroyed, right? For their arrogant disregard of the truth. And we ask ourselves, you know, that sounds kind of harsh. Uh, maybe they weren't deserving of that. Allah Azza wa Jal, first and foremost, before any other attribute, right, is Al-Rahman and Al-Rahim, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. God does not play games with his creation, where he creates a circumstance and a situation and then finds ways to toy with or trick, right, the most esteemed of creation, the human being. No, these stories are meant to serve as examples that time and time again, when the signs are made clear and when the heart is unwilling to change or transform, right? And this is specifically for us, even in our day-to-day -day lives, when we are resistant to change, resistant to messages that may alter how we have to live our lives, right? When that arrogance seeps in, then that's where there is the difficulty and the trouble as to whether that kind of heart can truly be receptive to the truth, right? And so for Allah Azza wa Jal, in these instances, justice is served when it is made explicitly clear that the people to whom the message was sent were too arrogant to even consider opening their hearts to submit to a power beyond their own ego and beyond their own nafs. In the chapter entitled Al-Anfal, The War Spoils, this is the second half basically, or towards the end of this section, Juz 9. Uh, this was a chapter revealed immediately after the Battle of Uhud. Right uh, now, the battle of sorry, the battle of Badr. Right, we know in the battle of Badr, the Muslims were outnumbered a thousand to three hundred. It was the first battle in which they were fighting their aggressors the night before the Prophet Sallallahu prays to God, saying and begging God, supplicating to Him not to have His community wiped out because if they lost that battle, the entire lineage of Islam would cease to to continue at that point. And so the Muslims are successful. They are given this divine help, even though they are outnumbered. And what immediately happens afterward is that there are three groups. There were two groups who continued to pursue the Muckins, the oppressors, after it was clear that the Muckins were on the retreat, that they were defeated. And then there was a third group that saw all the war spoils that existed on the battlefield and went out after those war spoils. Those first two groups, right? they went out of their way to seek out those who were retreating, right? And so this third group that started to acquire this booty was like, all right, they've left, this is all for us to keep. 
those first two groups come back and they see the third group claiming all the war spoils. And then there's a tussle and there's an argument. And people start mentioning, hey, I did this during the war. I took out these forces. This is what I contributed. And it was in the midst of that discussion argument that this chapter is revealed, Al-Anfal, where Allah Azza wa says in the very first verses, they ask you, O Prophet, about the battle gains. Say this is a matter for God and his messenger. So be mindful of God and make things right between you. Obey God and his messenger if you are true believers. The human uh, intellect and just how we function and perform is we are so hasty, right? That the moment, right? For these Muslims who just succeeded in fighting off their oppressor and in immediately being allured by the present wealth that was in front of them, forget the roots, forget the struggle that they came from and what they had to overcome. And now they became preoccupied with what was there in the moment, what was transient, over the truth that allowed them to transcend what was transient and ephemeral. And so this goes back to a message mentioned uh, in sessions before that I've shared, uh, is that Allah Azza wa continues to remind the Prophet وسلم, and the believers of where they came from and the struggle they endured to ensure that they do not lose that ability to empathize and that ability to be conscious of them ever being the ones who impose any sort of injustice themselves or impose any sort of uh, wrongful acquisition of material or power the way they were feeling the brunt of such acquisition of power by the oppressors when they were being oppressed. Allah says in this chapter, remember when you were few, victimized in the land, afraid that people might catch you, but God sheltered you and strengthened you with his help and provided you with good things so that you may be grateful. And I want to end on this point, and this ties back to what we started this session with, with regard to this verdict, right? The places that we've come from, socioeconomically, racially, ethnically, some of us may have grown with more struggle, some of us with less struggle, right? But we can all agree that we came from nothing, right? At the end of the day, humility is what's meant to envelop our hearts when it comes to the bounties, the blessings, the things that we've been given. Because the relationship that we have with this world is that Allah chooses to give out of his bounty and of his material in ways that he deems most appropriate what we choose to do with that, right? And how we are to then be held accountable for what we have possessed, right? And how we give out, right? That is our focus. And so knowing our roots, that we have come from nothing. And if we've been blessed with greater wealth or sustenance, then that's all the more responsibility that that's meant to then be directed to those who don't have it. And if you need to be reminded of your roots, look to the stories of the people of Badr, the stories of the prophets of the past, of the prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, constantly being told by God, don't forget your origins, right? Because the moment you start to develop a mindset that you feel entitled to what you've been given, then the soul starts to feel that arrogance and that ego. Then it becomes harder to submit yourself to a higher power. It becomes harder to feel that what you have is actually meant for others to benefit from just as much as you've been able to benefit from yourself. So we'll go ahead and end with that. The name of Allah, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy and praise and blessings be on his beloved prophet and his family and his companions. It's so good to see everyone. I'm sad. I missed yesterday, but alhamdulillah, we were holding a community space to process the verdict that came out. And alhamdulillah, initially, I felt a lot of relief, relief mostly for George Floyd's family. And then later I realized how frustrated I was by how low the bar was. And subhanAllah, may Allah make this the beginning of more good to come. Inshallah, and more justice and accountability. And alhamdulillah. It, I feel like the Quran in these moments becomes, it feels a lot more real because it's addressing issues of what do we do when we're in power? What do we do when we have privilege? But also what do we do when we don't have power and we don't have privilege, subhanAllah. So today we're reciting juz number 10 and it covers the second half of Surah Al-Anfal and the beginning of Surah Al-Tawbah. And inshallah we'll continue Surah Al-Tawbah tomorrow. Um, the last Surah Al-Anfal is about 10 pages. So this is the, the, the second five and then the beginning of Surah Al-Tawbah. 
Subhanallah, Surah Al-Anfal, a lot of what it addresses is um, just a moment in Islamic history, which was the Battle of Badr. And Surah At-Tawbah addresses towards the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and it was talking about the conquest of Mecca. And the Muslims were in a very different position in the beginning than they were at the end. And again, it's really interesting to see how the Quran talks about these things. During the Battle of Badr, they were like, by definition, the underdogs. They were outnumbered three to one. And there was so much that was going on. And, and yet the surah starts off admonishing people that were fighting over, over money, over material wealth. And it wasn't a fight fight, but it was still the Quran was addressing them and saying, you still have to take care of your greed. There's never a point where we can say, oh, I've arrived. I feel no greed. As long as you're living in this dunya, materialism is, has its, and, and the dunya has its own seductive nature. So it's a point of continuing to work on ourselves. And in both surahs, you see how over and over and over again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, this is still about your morality, your relationship with him, not about a certain like level of privilege or power or whatever it is. So the chapter 10 starts off where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks, addresses the, the believers, and it's talking about how the money that they they won in this battle was going to be defi- divided and it was going to be given to people who were orphans, people who were in need, people who were disconnected from their home countries. And it, in this ayah, it says, Yawm al-Furqan, the day that was decisive, on the day when the two groups met and Allah has power over everything. So the battle of Badr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually calls it the day where things were decisive where it separated the two groups. And the Muslims, again, were completely outnumbered. And there's a point they didn't plan to plan. The battle plans changed. They were ready for what they were ready for. And then the, 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 the plan changed on them. And there's a moment where you see the Prophet ﷺ, this is the first time that the Muhajirin and the Ansar and both surahs actually address those two groups of people. So the people that migrated from Mecca were called the Muhajirin those who migrated and they were it's it's they were they were religious refugees they were people that were being persecuted but we honor them and we call them the muhajirin those who migrated and the people that received them in medina were known as the ansar those who gave them victory and those who took them in so the prophet sallallahu when he first arrived in medina they wrote something called the constitution of medina which if you've never checked it out it's truly incredible the they write the constitution of Medina that talks about this idea of citizenship of the Muslims in Medina and the pagans in Medina and the Jews in Medina are all part of this larger citizenship of Medina. And the Prophet Sallallahu in that moment, he does, it's interesting because what he, it's small advice, but it's really powerful. He tells them, Afshu salam wa ta'am wa arham. He tells them, feed food, a spread peace, feed food, and fulfill your family bonds and pray at night when people are sleeping and you will enter paradise with ease. And they seem like simple words, but these same words are actually what forge the relationship between everyone in Medina, despite their difficulties, despite everything they'd been through, despite all of their trauma. The Ansad were overcoming a civil war and spreading peace, feeding food, fulfilling their family bonds, praying at night, helped to bring them, all of them together. The Prophet ﷺ also did something called the Mu'akha, where he assigned every family that was in need with a family that could help them. And this is what bridged all of the, those, those, small, those gaps in the community where someone could fall through. The Prophet ﷺ put in a lot of effort to make the, sure that those, those spaces were filled and those gaps were healed. So now when they go out for the Battle of Badr, this is the first time that they're actually at battle fighting alongside each other. And in, before the battle, the Prophet ﷺ kept asking the Ansar, are you sure? Because you're now making a commitment that you didn't sign up for. And they said, they told the Prophet ﷺ, look, we are with you. We believed in you. We will follow you. We knew this day was coming. We knew if we followed the Prophet that the Arabs were going to fight us. We knew it was a matter of time and here we are. So subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them such a resounding victory, and it was known as Yawm al-Furqan. And there are a lot of miracles that happened during the battle that are mentioned in the surah. 
And there's a few things that in the surah that I think are really interesting where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in uh, um, ayah number 53, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah doesn't change what is with the people until they change what is within themselves. And Allah is all hearing, all aware, all knowledgeable. SubhanAllah. We say this a lot, but this is the true reality of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring about change. Rumi was really interesting. He said, anger, war is anger magnified. Racism is arrogance magnified. If we all healed our hearts, we would, like the system, it is systemic, but the system is made up, up of people. And if you change the people, you change the system. And this is part of the task that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. If we fundamentally change ourselves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow this, our situation to change. And this isn't about, again, about gaining power or military might, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 60 says, do what you can. Do everything that you can. Don't sit back and say, oh, it's not working. No, try everything in your power. We are very creative. We are actually very resourceful. And if we put our energies towards something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill it. Because he promised us that. And in the same time, I know we're talking about battles, but in both surahs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so in ayah number 61, it says, and if they, they, try, they try to have a peace treaty, then you accept their peace treaty. And in the surah to Tawbah, it says something similar. It's saying if they put down their arms and say, we're not fighting you anymore, then they're not fighting you anymore. And that's that. SubhanAllah. In, the, in, in Surah At-Tawbah, in ayah number 25, it's, it's interesting because, again, we talked about how in Badr they were completely outnumbered. When it came to Mecca, the, pro, the conquest of Mecca, this happened in the eighth year. So Badr was in the second year of the Hijrah and, and um, conquest of Mecca was in the eighth year of the Hijrah. By the time they got to the eighth year of the Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ was, came out in an army of 10,000 that surrounded Mecca. And he did it in such a way to force their hands so that there wouldn't be fighting, so that there wouldn't be bloodshed. He is sitting here planning how to save the lives of his enemies. By the time they get to the conquest of Mecca, they had been fighting him. They persecuted them for 13 years and then fought them for another eight. And he lost family members and he had, was in so much pain. And yet he's planning how to save the lives of his enemies, subhanAllah. Such a high level of just character that the Prophet ﷺ is exhibiting. And what always amazed me about this is it wasn't just his forgiveness. It was also an entire army of people that had that same level of forgiveness. And the people, there were a handful of people, the war criminals, they were going to be held to account. If you killed people in cold blood, you were going to be held to account. But for the rest of the community, it was a new page. It was a new time, subhanAllah. Not too long after the conquest of Mecca, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes another battle in Yawm Hunayn. It was another battle that came up shortly thereafter. Right after they conquered Mecca, the second most powerful city in, in the Arabian Peninsula decided this is the, like, if they take over, this is the end of us. And they started to attack the Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ actually came in as a conqueror and he spent 19 days in a tent. He didn't commandeer anyone's space. And now they're faced with another military challenge and they came out and they were a much larger army, the largest they'd ever been. And on, in that moment, some of the believers said, oh, we have the numbers this time. Forgetting that it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that gave them victory in the first place. And when they initially went in, they actually were ambushed and they started to lose miserably. And the Muslims started to disperse and the Prophet ﷺ found himself standing there alone. And he started to charge forward and he started saying at the top of his lungs, I am, I am the prophet that is the truth. I am the son of Abd al-Muttalib. And when the Muslims realized what was happening, they turned around and followed him even though initially they were being defeated. And again, it was a reminder. And in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you thought you were going to win based on numbers. If you don't have the moral standing, you will not win. It is one of the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designed the world. It is part of his gift to us as an ummah, that when we're not standing on morality, he doesn't let us win. If we lose who we are, it's just a matter of time before we start losing. 
And you see almost every Muslim empire, every time Muslims were in power, they will rise up because they, they are fighting for justice. And when they forget the lessons that they were preaching, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very quickly brought them down. SubhanAllah. So Surah At-Tawbah covers a lot of things. In ayah number 40 is, is another beautiful ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the believers, you don't have to give the Prophet victory. I already gave him victory. And it's actually describing the moment during his hijrah where him and Abu Bakr were hiding in a cave. And you look at that and you think, how is that victory? But it was. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had brought him out of the city that was oppressive and brought him into a city that would take him in, that would allow the healing to begin. SubhanAllah. One of the criticisms they mentioned of the Prophet that the, the disbelievers were criticizing the Prophet for was mentioned in Ayah 61. And it's such an odd criticism. I always thought this Ayah was so funny. They would criticize the Prophet and they say, Hua udun. He's an ear. He listens to everything everyone tells him. And what they're critiquing is that he's a leader that listens to his community. And the ayah says, udhun lakum. It's, he, he listens, and that's a good thing. He believes in Allah and he believes in the believers. He believes in the mu'mineen. May Allah make us among the mu'mineen. May Allah allow us to understand leadership in a way that is supposed to be accessible and close to us. SubhanAllah. I, I just want to end with the Prophet said that very early on in Islam, the Arabs had a saying of unsur akhaka dhaliman aw madhuma, protect your brother whether they're the oppressor or the oppressed. And of course, Islam came and changed this and said, no, morality comes first. So they said, subhanAllah, the, the, the Prophet said, no, we support our brothers when they're oppressed and morality is more important. And then all the way at the end of the Prophet's life, he repeated that statement. And they were confused. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, we understand when they're the oppressed. How is it if they're the oppressor? He said, if you love your brother when they're the oppressor, then you need to stop them from their oppression. That is an act of love. Us holding each other to account is an act of love. So that no one meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, having been an oppressor and never having heard from the people that claim to love them, from their community, not telling them, hey, maybe this is not good for you. SubhanAllah. If you would like to listen to more, please donate to www.icnyu.org slash donate. For more of our virtual programs, go to www.icnyu.org slash classes. If you have any questions, email us at info at icnyu.org.